So I'll be talking about the use of ketamine for depression and uh, focusing on uh, addiction. Um, I've been working as an emergency physician uh, primarily in the U.S. for about 20 years. Um, in that time, I've seen hundreds of people die from the effects of alcohol, tobacco, opiates, and other drugs. I've also saved many lives, but often of the same person who relapses again and again uh, without adequate treatment. This is a global problem. Uh, even in Norway, one of the happiest countries in the world, the combined lifetime prevalence of substance use disorders is about 40%. Uh, Addiction and depression share a common fundamental of being stuck in patterns of thought and behavior with negative consequences. And there's a high comorbidity between the two. Um, this last uh, year, suicide, about a million people in the world killed themselves by suicide. That's more people than died in all wars and all natural disasters combined. Today, depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. Um, Edgar Allan Poe described his uh, struggle with addiction. It has not been in the pursuit of pleasure that I've periled life and reputation and reason. It has been the desperate attempt to escape from torturing memories, from a sense of insupportable loneliness, and a dread of some strange impending doom. And uh, Jean Cocteau described his opium addiction. Here I am trying to live, or rather, I'm trying to teach the death within me how to live. Our current state of global suffering is a complex interplay of genetics, adverse childhood experience, and other social and environmental factors. I'm going to focus primarily on the latter and discuss uh, the use of ketamine for addiction. Um, this is Luca. Luca is our last universal common ancestor. About three and a half billion years ago, the last common ancestor of all life on Earth. Uh, shortly after Luca, we developed our first mode of transportation, which was chemotaxis, a way of seeking out positive and avoiding negative, negative chemical gradients in our environment. Drug use, whether with chemicals or with plants, is a basic animal instinct to improve our lot in life, to alter and improve our conscious experience. The majority of people in the world who use drugs don't become addicted, uh, but for those who do, the consequences are severe and difficult to treat. Anybody recognize this film? It's a great film. Uh, the, uh, Take a moment and try to imagine the world we lived in, essentially all of the 10 million years since we branched off from our uh, common, an uh, common ancestor with chimpanzees. Small groups of hunter-gatherers with deeply socially interconnected lives, completely immersed in and dependent on our ecosystem. Today, the majority of people in the world live in cities. In the global north, 90% of our entire lives are spent in buildings. In the United States today, the average person spends over 10 hours a day staring into some kind of screen. As uh, Krishnamurti said, it's no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Our brain function was sculpted by adaptation to our physical and social environments over millions of years. 
the term paleo deficit disorder describes this discordant mismatch between our current and our evolutionary environment and a disconnection with that life as a source of decreased global well being. Einstein said, the human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separate from the rest, in a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. Alan Watts liked to describe it as the universe peopling, just like an apple, apple tree apples. One does not exist outside of the context of this connection. But we get so caught up in our experience as a wave, we forget we're also part of the ocean. Careful use of uh, powerful psychoactives like ketamine can help facilitate this experience of connection for depression, anxiety, and addiction, in part by stimulating what the astronauts call the overview effect, a profound and ineffable sense that you're part of a larger interconnected world. Um, Andreas and Ben uh, uh, mentioned uh, the work of uh, Humphrey Osmond. Uh, he was the, the one that coined the ter term psychedelic in his letter to Aldous Huxley. Um, he, he discussed his uh, work with alcohol abuse. One interesting thing is the, the reason that he decided to do this study with LSD was that he had noted that um, alcoholics who went through the severe delirium of alcohol withdrawal uh, seemed to be more likely to be abstinent. So his thought was that perhaps LSD could stimulate the delirium of alcohol withdrawal. Um, and just a quick uh, note on using drugs of abuse in medicine. Um, this is something that we've always done and we continue to do. Drugs can be used, drugs can be abused. In my work as an emergency physician, I use cocaine to stop nosebleeds. I use heroin analogs for severe pain. We use amphetamines for ADHD. I use IV caffeine for headaches. Uh, obviously, ketamine for anesthesia. I once even sent an ambulance with lights and sirens to a liquor store to go get a bottle of vodka because I had a patient with antifreeze poisoning who had tried to kill himself and uh, alcohol is the antidote. So ketamine is a uh, medicine that was synthesized in 1962, actually as a, um, as a better alternative to the previous anesthetic we were using, which was PCP, or angel dust. Turns out PCP is actually a pretty good anesthetic, but it doesn't have a great side effect profile. Um, so, um, ketamine is a, a new, was a new class of uh, medicines called disassociatives, which cause a separation uh, from both the body and the mind. Ketamine was FDA approved in 1970, um, and today is one of the most widely used medicines in the world in anesthesia, in pain control. It's replaced morphine for use in combat medicine. Um, and it's on the WHO list of essential medicines because of its uh, safety pro profile and use. Um, it was used in the 1970s and 80s in uh, drug-assisted psychotherapy. Um, and over the last decade, we've been using it for the treatment of depression. Um, the doses that we use for mood disorders is actually super low. To get an idea, when I have to sew up a baby in the emergency room, I give them a shot of ketamine that's eight times the dose that I use to treat depression. Um, and we use it on ch children because of the safety profile. But even at these really low doses, it's tremendously psychoactive. 
It causes a feeling of awe, positive mood, altered perception, cognition, an altered sense of space and time, and a detachment from both the body and the mind, kind of uh, replacing, replaced with uh, a sense of unity with something larger. It's less, than an, less of an ego death or an ego loss than an expansion of the boundary of your conscious attention. I like to call it intravenous meditation uh, because it, uh, you're conscious, but your thoughts are just drifting by. Ketamine is a, a powerful treatment for uh, depression. Even in patients that uh, don't respond to any other therapies, uh, about two-thirds will respond to a single dose of ketamine within hours. And a single dose of ketamine can decrease suicidal thoughts for up to six weeks. Um, in, in my work uh, using this, I've, I've literally seen hundreds of lives saved by this medicine. Um, so uh, the first work on um, ketamine for addiction was uh, pioneered by Yevgeny Krupitsky in uh, St. Petersburg in the 1980s. Uh, he initially reported um, using a single dose of ketamine, a one-year abstinence of 66%, which is quite remarkable. Uh, this work is being replicated by a group in England right now, uh, Celia Morgan and her group, in a large clinical trial. He later did uh, work on heroin. He initially reported a two-year abstinence rate of 17%. And then, uh, using three doses given over three months, a one-year abstinence rate of 50%. This is pretty remarkable compared to current treatment for heroin addiction. Um, as far as cocaine addiction, there's not a lot of good treatments for stimulant addictions uh, in general. Um, Elias Dockwar at Columbia uh, did an, a small study in 2014 showing increased motivation to quit, decreased craving, and decreased use over a, mo a month. A uh, subsequent study, um, which was a really interesting study, he, he actually gave cocaine-addicted patients the choice to get cocaine or money. I have no idea how he got this approved, but he actually gave them cocaine if they wanted it. Uh, there was a, after a single dose of ketamine, there was a 67% reduction in uh, cocaine choice. Uh, mo more recently, a couple months ago, uh, he published uh, a larger study, which was a single dose of uh, ketamine and showing a five-week abstinence of 48%. And this is really remarkable for something where there's not a lot of good treatment. Taken overall, uh, ketamine for substance use disorders with these very small preliminary trials um, is it's about two to three times as effective as current standard pharmacotherapies. So ketamine works by, um, in part by stimulating neuroplasticity. That's increasing the number of branches and the number of connections between your brain cells. This translates into increased flexibility and resilience in your thoughts, your feelings, and your behavior. It also uh, resets electrical networks in the brain, uh, reversing some of the effects of chronic stress and depression. It causes uh, increased activity in the prefrontal cortex. It decreases rumination on the self in what's called the default mode network. Um, and an interesting network that it resets is something called the anti-reward network. Uh, this is a part of your brain that is designed to make you feel bad, hopeless, helpless, sad. Why do we even have a part of our brain that makes us feel bad? That seems like a terrible idea. Um, but 
it's actually adaptive. Imagine you're going out on a hunt and you can't find any food. Well, you should feel bad because next time you have to take a different path. Uh, if you're looking for a mate and you can't get any sex, you better feel bad or our species is going to die. But the problem is that when this happens again and again and again, the expectation of a positive reward that you never get, uh, neglect, love that you don't get, trauma, particularly early in, in childhood, uh, this uh, part of your brain uh, which has negative outputs to dopamine and serotonin areas gets hyperactive and cocaine shuts this off completely sorry, not cocaine, uh, ketamine, shuts this off completely. And um, I have cocaine on my brain from the last slide. Um, and then when it gets reset, it's, it's like a resetting a thermostat. It kind of goes back to a normal state of room temperature. Uh, there's also some evidence uh, to suggest that the disassociative experience of ketamine is, has, uh, is a positive predictor for positive outcomes with depression and addiction. Uh, the out-of-body experience, the um, near-death experience. And um, the, some of uh, my colleagues at uh, Johns Hopkins have called this uh, inverse PTSD. So we all know that a single traumatic negative event even if it lasts for 15 minutes, rape, seeing a murder, can have profound lifelong negative effects on your nervous system. But likewise, perhaps a profound positive experience can have profound, long-lasting positive effects on your nervous system as well. Our ancestral environment was a a gym for our physical body, but it was also a gym for our minds. Our current understanding of stress and addiction is modeled on experiments done on rats in cages. Rats in cages are isolated from social contact, they're isolated from nature, and they become stressed, they become depressed, and vulnerable to addiction. But what is our modern life becoming if not a bunch of isolating cages? And uh, as Lily Tomlin said, the trouble with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. <laughs> the, uh, the microbiologist um, Rene Dubot said, even when man has become an urbane city dweller, the paleolithic bull that survives inside his inner self still paws the earth. I believe that we need to try to recreate the social and physical environments that have positive effects on our mind. <laughs> Um, ketamine has revolutionized our approach for, uh, to a, the treatment of depression, um, in part by shifting this focus from the self to feelings of connection. If the uh, preliminary trials that have been done uh, in the past on using uh, ketamine for addiction um, are replicated, uh, I believe that uh, ketamine is going to revolutionize our treatment of uh, addiction as well. Thank you very much.